Well, good morning. There we go. I can hear you now, too. That's better. Thanks for turning the audience on as well, Donald. Um, yeah, welcome here this morning. I'm excited you're here. I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity we have to worship together Sunday morning and, um, yeah, just to come together as a community. My name is Pastor Matt Hirsch. I'm the children's and youth pastor here, and I get to share because Pastor Joseph is in Victoria. He's there for his 20-year wedding anniversary, which is fantastic. So next time you see him, say congratulations. And uh, I don't know what else you say to people on their anniversary. I don't know. Good work. Way to go. But So uh, I'm continuing on in the, my first ever crack at my own series, and we're calling it Life Lessons in Biblical Wisdom Literature. And the biblical wisdom literature consists of only three books in the Bible, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And so we're taking a Sunday to look at each one. Uh, we started off in Proverbs. Oh, sorry. Um, the books of the wisdom literature, they're all wrestling with this one question. And the question is, oh, looks like my thingy's not going to work. Can you go to the next slide there? Donald, can you come reconnect this? While Donald is coming, we'll just keep going. But the question that they all ask is this question of how to be good at life. How do I live life well? How do I succeed at this thing called life? And each book answers that question in a different way, and it isn't until we experience the wisdom of all three of the books and hold their answers in tension that we truly get a biblical answer of how to live the good life. We began in Proverbs, and the whole wisdom of Proverbs lies in something called the retribution principle. And the retribution principle, simply put, is if one does evil, they will reap punishment. If someone does good, they will reap reward. So the answer that Proverbs gives to the answer of how to live good life is do good and you'll be rewarded. Do evil and you'll be punished. Proverbs also sees this type of wisdom as an attribute of God. It's a part of who God is. And it also says that all wisdom begins with something called the fear of the Lord. Last time we were in the book of Ecclesiastes and we were introduced to Kohelet, or the teacher, and he observed that life isn't always fair, like the way that Proverbs says it is. Sometimes you do the good thing and you don't get rewarded. Sometimes the people who aren't doing good, who are doing bad in the world, seem to have, be living life quite well. And this led him to conclude that everything is hevel. It's a vapor. It's a smoke. It's not ordered like Lady Wisdom says it is in Proverbs, but it's random. Time and chance and death happen to us all. So he concluded at the very end that the key to living the good life is just to be present in life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy the life that you have. Don't obsess about the future. Don't dwell on the past, but live in the moment. Live in the present. Enjoy what you have right now. Enjoy a sunrise, a good cup of coffee with a friend, a meal uh, with a loved one. Be present in the moment. And the author of Ecclesiastes, he offers his own uh, conclusion at the end, and he tells his readers that what the teacher was right in what he said, but in the end, you should still fear the Lord and keep his commandments, because in the end, God will make every good deed known, whether, or every deed known, whether good or bad. He is the ultimate judge. So we have one more book to go. We have one more person to meet, and so we are going to tackle the book of Job. We have met Lady Wisdom. We have met the sharp, middle-aged critic, and now we're going to meet the weathered old man. And we're going to be moving at lightning speed. We're going to try to do the entire book of Job this morning. So we're going to go on fast. If you have your Bibles with you, open up to Job. We'll be starting at the beginning. I'll have most of the scriptures up on the back wall if you don't, um, if you don't have your Bible with you this morning. But Job is a very, very, very long book. It's a very, very dense book. It's a very complicated book. Scholars still struggle on how to, to translate some of the words. So if you're into biblical scholarship and you want to translate ancient Hebrew, there's still work to be done. You can go for it. So we're going to get into Job today. Before we do, let's just pray. Father God, thank you for this morning, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share. And we just pray that you'd bless Joseph and Sherry this morning as they are in Victoria, Lord God. Uh, thank you for 20 years of marriage. We pray for many more and that their um, marriage would just be a shining example of your love for us, Lord God. For this morning, we pray that you would just be with us as we uh, gather together and look into your word and uh, try to grapple with some, some really real, intense things, Lord God. Uh, I pray for this morning, just open ears and open hearts, Lord God, and for myself, uh, may the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So if you go into the gym at Prairie Bible College, you will see up in one of the top right corners, you will see a soccer jersey. It is hung there. And this soccer jersey, it belonged to a student that went there 
uh, a few years before I got there. And uh, this student, one night, him and his friends, they decided to just go out for a little drive. It was late at night, and they hopped into their car, and they left town. And they came to a railroad crossing. And what they didn't know was that before that, a train had actually gone across this railroad crossing, and it actually lost a car. It had lost a flat deck, empty trailer. And that trailer stopped directly in the path of the railroad crossing. They didn't see it. They ran right into it. And now that jersey hangs in the corner of the gym in memory of him. A total freak accident. How does something like that happen? It reminds me of this country song that basically tells the same story. It's called The Jersey on the Wall. And in the course, uh, the author, when she, she sings it, she says that when she gets to heaven, she's going to ask God some questions. Stuff like, how do you make the snowflake? Are you angry when the earth quakes? How do you keep this big rock spinning? But the last question that she wants to ask God, she wants to ask him, why can't you stop a car from crashing? Why can't you do that? The second verse hits the nail right on the head when she says, I bet somewhere there's a yearbook in a box under a bed with the senior picture missing and a loving memory instead. And somewhere there's a mother who stopped going to church because her plan quit making sense down here on earth. It's just a, an emotional song. I remember the first time we heard that song, Megs and I were leaving Banff from uh, a retreat. And so it was like this happy moment. You know, we just had a great time. And then we listened to this song. But it's a, it's a, it's a great song. When tragedy strikes, the response that many people have is the exact response of the mother in that song. I can't tell you how many teens, young adults, grown adults, I can't have to tell you how many of them tell me that they don't believe in God, and the reason they don't believe in God is because they don't want to believe in a good God who would let suffering happen. They want to, don't want to believe in a God who would let that car crash. And they end up asking the question that many of us are asking, where's God? Where is he when tragedy strikes? What is he doing up there? What is he thinking? Because his plan has quit making sense down here on earth. How could a good God allow war, allow natural disasters? Megs and I, we just recently watched a movie about the 2004 tsunami that hit Thailand, where 230,000 people were killed. 37,000 are still missing. Their bodies were never found. People often approach the book of Job to try and solve this problem. They, they approach the book of Job to try and answer the why question. Why is it that bad things seem to happen? Why is it that bad things happen to good people? Why does anyone suffer at all? However, the book of Job, it doesn't actually answer this question at all. Rather, the book of the Job is exploring the type of world that we live in. What type of world is it that God has ordered and set before us? And what does that say about who God is? It just shows us a small glimpse of where God is when tragedy strikes. The book of Job is a very long book. It's 42 chapters in length, and the structure is actually quite straightforward. Basically, the structure of the book is there's two chapters of narrative that introduce the story, and then there is 38 chapters of dense Hebrew poetry that take up the majority of the book, and at the very end, there's a, there's a narrative epilogue that concludes the story. The book starts by introducing us to this man named Job, and this guy, um, from what we see in the first introduction, is he is blameless. He is upright. He's a really great guy. He's so good, in fact, that he offers sacrifices for his kids just in case they made a mistake somewhere. This is the type of guy he is. And on top of all of this, we learn that he is loaded. This guy has stuff. He's got camels, sheep, oxen, donkeys. For whatever reason, when you, when you read the book of Job, the author is just obsessed with donkeys. Like, they just show up everywhere. Specifically, the wild donkey. The author loves the wild donkey. I've never met a wild donkey, but the way he describes it, I'm like, I want one. I want one of those things. <laughs> but anyway, so Job, he's the richest guy in the area. And it seems kind of counterintuitive, because from my experience, sometimes the richest guys in the areas aren't necessarily the most upright and blameless. Like, they probably didn't get rich by being upright and blameless. But here Job is. He's the richest in his entire area. He's upright. He's blameless. And in the next verse, we get this interesting scene. Verse 6, it says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with him. This is how the NIV translates it, but I really like how the ESV translates it. I think they do a better job. 
It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Sons of God is a better translation, and what this does is it introduces us to God's divine counsel. It's this group of spiritual beings that assist God in governing and ruling the universe. And with them comes Satan, which seems kind of, um, kind of odd and peculiar. In fact, scholars have, have uh, this been an interesting passage, or passage for discussion for many, many years. And recently, there's been a debate going on in biblical scholarship about who this figure is. Who exactly is it? And the whole reason for this is simply because of the presence of a definitive article in the original Hebrew. So what that means is every time the Hebrew word for Satan, which is Satan, every time it shows up, there's the in front of it. So it's Hasatan, not just Satan. And basically what that turns it into is it turns it into a title rather than a personal name. If you have a good study Bible, it'll take note of this if you can read it. We still translate it to be the big adversary, um, Satan himself, but scholars have begun to uh, debate whether or not that is the best translation. So, of course, this is a massive rabbit hole that you can go down, and I'm not going to this morning. And so for this morning, I'm just going to say what the original text says. I will just say the adversary, um, because that is how to literally translate that phrase. So if you hear me say that, and it says Satan in the verse, don't freak out. That's just why we're doing it. If this stuff interests you, come see me afterwards, and we can go down the rabbit hole together. It's a lot of fun. Anyways. So this, the adversary, he comes before God in his divine counsel, and God says to him, he starts bragging. He says, look at my servant Job. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then the adversary basically responds and says, well, of course Job is a good guy. Look at all the stuff you've given him. He's only good because you reward him. So basically, the adversary calls into question the idea that good people should even be rewarded in the first place. They're not being good for goodness sake. They're just being good to get the stuff. He tells God, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Job is only good because you reward him. If you take it all away, he'll surely curse you to your face. So God says, okay, go for it. Take away all his stuff, and in one fell swoop, Job loses everything. In a single day, messenger after messenger comes up and gives him bad news. He loses his sheep, his camels, his oxen, his donkeys, all of his servants, and finally, his family. All of his children are killed in one tragic accident. Then the text says, At this, Job got up. He tore his robe, shaved his head, and then fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So Job passed the test. He did it. The story could end right there, but of course it doesn't. It keeps going on. It says, the sons of God once again gather on another day. And again, God uplifts his servant Job. Again, he starts bragging about his servant Job to the adversary. And he says, again, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. After everything that's happened, he says Job is still upright. And the adversary responds. He says, skin for skin, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand, strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. So again, the, the gauntlet has been drawn. God says, okay, go for it. And the passage tells us that Job is covered in painful sores, from the tip of his toes to the crown of his head. He's in so much pain and agony that he takes broken pottery pieces just to try to scrape the boils off his skin to get some relief. Uh, his wife even comes to him. And she says, are you still clinging on to your integrity? Like, what are you doing? Like, give up. Curse God and die. Give up this good guy act. Why bother? Job replies to his wife. He says, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job passes the next test. He is still an upright and blameless person in spite of everything that has happened to him. And then we get introduced into the three other main characters of the book. 
Job's friends. We have Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. So if any of you are looking for great baby names, look no farther. <laughs> they hear about his suffering, and they come to comfort him. They come to, to ease his suffering, ease his pain. They see him from a distance, and they can't even recognize him. They don't even know what he, what he looks like anymore. They weep aloud with him. They tear their robes. They sprinkle dust on their heads, and they sit in silence with him for seven days. Seven days they sit in silence and say nothing. Now again, the story could have ended right there. Could have just been done. Job has passed the test once again. He and his friends have given us a very, very articulate picture of how to be with someone in suffering. Um, but that, of course, is not how it ends. Job speaks, and what he says reveals that there is much more going on inside this man than what meets the, the, than what meets the eye. The entire third chapter is this elaborate poem, this elaborate poem where Job curses the day he was born. Like, he is just broken. He says things like, May the day of my birth perish, and the night that said a boy conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no lights shine on it. And he goes into some really, 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 really dark places. For example, in verses 11 to 13, he says this, Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying in peace. I would be at sleep and at rest. It would have been better if he just died as a kid than to be where he's at right now. His life would have been so much better if that had happened. He concludes in verse 26. He says, I have no peace, no quietness, no rest, only turmoil. He may have passed the test, but Job is clearly broken. He is clearly in anguish over the suffering that has happened to him. And following this is what the scholars, what scholars call the cycles. And basically, the way it goes is one of Job's friends will respond to Job, and Job will respond to him, then the next friend will respond, and then Job will respond, and the last friend will respond. And they go in order every time. It's always Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job. Three times they go through this cycle, although the third cycle breaks down and Zophar doesn't get a chance to speak. This takes up the vast majority of the book. Most of the book is, is these conversations of them going back, back and forth. It's chapters 3 through 31, and it all contains this dialogue, and it is all dense Hebrew poetry, just dripping with imagery. There's an Israeli scholar. His name is Matis Yahu Sivat. not 100% sure if I got that right, but... And uh, he sums up the conversation perfectly between Job and his friends. If you want to understand the debate in the book, then all you need to do is imagine a triangle. At the top of the triangle is God's justice. At the lower right is the retribution principle. And on the other left is Job's innocence. And essentially what the, the discussion in the book is everyone in the book is trying to struggle how all of these things can be true at the same time. And nobody can quite figure it out. Uh-oh, I lost my... I lost my playlist here. Well, if I had it here, I had made a nice little graphic for you of the triangle. Is it really? Fantastic. That is just the greatest thing ever. So there you go. There's the triangle. You guys have probably all read it already. So this is, this is the tension of the book. Job knows that he is innocent. And he assumes that the retribution principle is how God runs the world. He assumes that's how God operates. And this leads him to ultimately question God's justice. That's where he ultimately ends up at the end of the book. His friends, on the other hand, they, are, they, have the other, they assume the complete opposite. They assume that God is just, and that this means that God always runs the universe according to this strict principle of just compensation. And so they infer from that that Job therefore cannot be innocent. He can't be innocent. There must be something you might, you might have done wrong, Job. So the dialogue, dialogue is quite literally Job defending his innocence. Job saying, I did nothing wrong. I am an innocent man. And his friends telling him that you must have done something wrong. 
They don't believe that he is innocent. He must have done something really bad to deserve all of this. God is just. He runs the world by the, the retribution principle. Job is suffering. Therefore, Job, you can't be innocent. It's just not possible. And his friends, they even start making up hypothetical sins that Job must have committed to deserve this. Uh, one example here is Eliphaz. He says, Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You demanded security from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary, and you withheld food from the hungry. Though you are a powerful man, owning land, an honored man, living on it, you sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. My friends, Job did not do any of these things. We know that. We know he didn't do that. Because at the beginning of the book, God himself says, Job is an upright and blameless man. You and I have that vantage point. Job and his friends do not. They don't know the conversation God had beforehand. They don't know how pumped God was about how upright and blamelessly, blame, blameless he is. Oops, sorry. They don't know about any of that. I do want to make one quick point here, though. When I was growing up, my way of kind of excusing what happened to Job here was uh, I, would, I would just say, well, nobody is perfect, right? I mean, we're all, we're all sinners. We're all fallen. We've all made mistakes. Um, surely Job, you know, he, he wasn't a perfect guy, so he deserved what he got in the end. He must have done something wrong. Maybe he told a little white lie. Maybe he had an angry thought towards someone. Or maybe he kept a little money to himself when he should have given away. But this misses the point of what is going on here. Job actually acknowledges in his speeches that he isn't perfect. What he's saying that he, is, he isn't perfect, but he is blameless. That is his point. The point is that he didn't do anything wrong, uh, anything wrong to merit this particular type of suffering. He might have made a little mistake here and there, but he didn't do anything this grand to require this amount of suffering. So if we look at our triangle one more time, Job's friends, they have this point of view that God is just by which they mean he runs the world according to the strict principle of justice, the retribution principle. Therefore, Job must have sinned, and his friends, they defend this point to the end. Job has the opposite point of view. Job is insisting that he is righteous, and he assumes that God runs the world according to the strict principle of recompense. And so, as the emotional intensity of the book ramps up, as it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, Job starts calling his friends things like windbags, and worthless counselors. And eventually, the conclusion that he comes to at the end is that God is unjust. That's where, he, that's where he ends up being at, is God is unjust. He calls into question the justice of God. And then eventually, he just stops talking to his friends altogether. He doesn't even bother responding to them. And he just starts directly lobbying complaints at God. He's just, he's just fed up with God. And in his final, his final words, he says this. He's talking to God. He calls God to come and testify. He says, Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. I would give him account of every step. I would present it to him as a ruler. So what Job is saying right there, and he writes his final defense, and he says, If only God would just show up. Like, where are you, God? If only you would just show up, and if only you would write out every single thing I have done throughout my whole life, that list would be so fantastic, I would put it on my shoulder. I would wear that list on my head like a crown. You could use that as a ruler to judge the actions of others. That's how great it is. That's Job's, Job's um, acute crown, or his last, last words to God. If only God would do this, then everyone would see that Job's suffering is, that, is not warranted and that God is unjust. He basically is demanding God to come and defend himself. We get a very, it's almost like a courtroom scene. Come and defend yourself. Come and answer how you could let this happen. He's saying, where are you, God? What are you doing? How could you let this happen? You must not be just. And then Job, he goes silent. He just gives up. He's done talking. Before we get to the good part of the book, there's one more thing that happens, and it's kind of it's kind of random. It's kind of out of nowhere. But all of a sudden, after Job says his last piece, one more friend shows up. We get no introduction of when he shows up. We have no indication of, of how long he's been sitting there. All of a sudden, he is just there. And his name is Elihu. And we aren't given any indication of when he shows up. And when he talks, he is long-winded. He has just one 
really, really long poem. It's five chapters long, chapters 32 to 37. So I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> the nitty-gritty of, of everything that he says, but this is, this is the, the summation of his point. He's, he is mad at Job for lodging these complaints at God. He's mad at Job. How could you say these things about God? But he's also equally mad at Job's friends. He's saying, you guys can't prove him wrong, and yet you condemn him anyway. Like, you guys, you guys or Job might be calling in the, the justice of God, but you guys are acting unjust in, in your responses to him. And so he goes off on this tan, he just goes off on them and all this stuff. After all of this is where things get really good. It's my favorite part of the book. And uh, it's, just, it's just the best. I love it. After all these long poems, God does the unthinkable. He shows up. He says, here I am, Job. And he, he answers Job's request, and he presents himself before him. Job 38, verse 1 to 3 says, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I love that. It's just so great. And God actually says this several times in his response. He'll say, Brace yourself like a man. Like, I feel like if I'm ever going to say something, like, really intense, I'm just going to start doing it. Brace yourself like a man. <laughs> anyway. So God says this to him. He says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. God shows up, and he shows up in a storm. He shows up in power, in majesty. And he says, buckle up, Job. You may have asked me some questions, but I'm going to ask you some questions, which is really just a classic Jesus move, isn't it? So Job, or God starts off, and he gives Job a virtual tour of the universe. And the, book, the song that we sang this morning that Kevin chose, Indescribable, is actually based off of this, this part of this speech. Job, or God gives Job a virtual tour of the universe. And he asks Job's questions like, Where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? Who set out and marked the dimensions of space and time? Who set the boundaries of the ocean? Did you do that? Did you just tell the ocean to stop right there where it does? Have you ordered the sun to rise? Have you journeyed to the bottom of the ocean and explored all of its depths? Can you loosen Orion's belt? I love that one. That constellation in the sky, can you unbuckle it? Can you tell it to move? Can you bring forth constellations and seasons? And we can easily update this to our time. God is essentially asking Job questions like, hey Job, do you know what gravity is? Can you explain why light is both a particle and a wave? Can you tell me all the intricacies of quantum physics, why an atom doesn't appear to be there until after you observe it? Where were you when the cosmic radiation of creation was cooling? Where were you, Job? There's this stand-up comedian, and he does this great routine that kind of gets at the sentiment. And he says that everything is made up of molecules. The chair that you're sitting on, this pulpit is all made of molecules. The food that you eat is made out of molecules. And you and I are made of the exact same molecules. And he says, that doesn't make sense. How is it that the molecules that clump together to form me know that they're molecules? I'm just walking around going, I'm ah, mad. That doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't your chair know that it is a chair? Why doesn't this pulpit know it's a pulpit? There's this crazy theory in science, in mainstream science, it's, it's wild. The theory is that the sun has consciousness. Did you know that? There's people, there's legit people who believe that. And the reason they believe it is because the sun is made up of the same stuff you and I are made up of. You and I somehow gain consciousness. Why couldn't the sun do it? It makes no sense. And that's the point. That is the point that God is making. You can't even begin to grasp the complexities and vastness of this universe. How do you expect to understand how God governs it? How can you expect to do that? The obvious question you know, sorry, the obvious answer to the questions that God asked Job is no. I wasn't there. No, I don't know how it works. We don't have the same vantage point of God. We experience knowledge on a micro level. God experiences it on a macro level. But God isn't done there. He says to Job, he says, if you think it's so easy, you run the world for a day. Give it your best shot. He says, bring every proud man down. Crush every wicked man where he stands. How would you micromanage the universe according to the strict principle of justice for every human action 24-7? How would you do it, Job? What would that world look like? 
And God even hints that if you actually did this, you would have to shake every human off of the rug of the earth. None of us would be left. And where God goes next is the most popular part of the book of Job. God introduces Job to two magnificent creatures. They're called Behemoth and Leviathan. And it's just great. I love, it's just the best part of the book. We have, we have no idea what these creatures are. There's the, there was this, uh, this one scholar back in the 1600s, actually. He decided he was going to document every single creature in the Bible and then journey to the Middle East and kind of give, like, observe them and give the best explanation for it. So he was the first guy who said that Behemoth was a hippo and that Leviathan was most likely a crocodile. Those, those were his assumptions. But if you read the descriptions that, jo- that God gives of these creatures, they just don't fit. The, the hippo one's pretty close. The only thing that's really weird is that it says that he has a, a tail like a cedar. And if you've ever seen a hippo's tail, it's not really that impressive. It's just... It's like a little paintbrush. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, Leviathan is especially tricky. The description that is given is basically that of a fire-breathing dragon. That, that, that's the description we're given. So if you want to imagine what Leviathan is, just think of Smaug from The Hobbit. It's this, this wild powerful, wise creature. And God brings them up because he wants to ask Job some questions about them. He says, hey, Job, can you tame them? Can you capture them? Can you get them to do what you want? If you lay a hand on these creatures, you're toast. They will devour you. They will gobble you up and destroy you. And yet God says that they're not evil. They're just a part of his creation. He made them the same way as he made you and me. I like to think of a great white shark. Like, we're just fascinated with, with sharks. We, we dedicate a whole week to these things. And the culmination, the crowning jewel of that entire week is the great white shark. Everyone just waits till the very end to watch that documentary on the great white shark. Just these crazy, daunting, apex predators that are mysterious and vague. We don't know much about them. But we're just taken in by their, their power. It's like God, God is asking Job, Hey, Job, would you swim with the great white shark? Can you tame it? Can you put a bridle in its mouth and ride it around? Would you catch it, put it in a pool for your kids to play with? The obvious answer is no. It's just ridiculous. Of course not. We can't begin to control God's creation or even understand how it all moves and acts together. So why should we expect to understand how God governs it? At this point, after all of this, Job responds, And he says this, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Job is humbled. He acknowledges God's point of view and has now accepted what has happened and still chooses to trust God because of his vast wisdom and knowledge. The book ends with a very short epilogue and in it, this, this is also a very fascinating part of the book. And you could probably do like multiple, like a, a very lengthy series just on the ideas behind these two verses. He says, God, God says to Job and his friends, oh, sorry, I lost my spot. He says, God, God rebukes Job's friends. He tells them that what they said about him was wrong. God rebukes Job's friends. He said, what you said about me was wrong. And then he uplifts Job and he says, what Job spoke about me was true. Now, if you go back and read the book of Job and list and really take in the things that Job says, he says some outrageous things, specifically about God. And God uplifts him and says, what you said is true, and what your friends said was not true about me. God's, God rebukes Job's friends because not only were they wrong about Job's innocence, but their black and white understanding of how God operates the world is incorrect. God affirms that he is just, and he affirms that Job is innocent, but what he says is that I do not govern the world by this black and white principle called the retribution principle. That is not how I operate the world. Rather, God says that he governs the world by something he calls his wisdom. So what he says, I govern the world by my wisdom. It's like there's two levels of wisdom. There's the wisdom of Proverbs that is simple. It's easy for us to grasp. It's good to live your life by that. It will work out. It's a good thing to do. But then there's another level of wisdom. And this wisdom is God's wisdom. 
And it is just beyond anything we can, comp we can comprehend. It is beyond anything that we can think about. Even if God just somehow downloaded all of his wisdom into your mind, if he was able to just plug a USB cord right in here and just like plunk it all in there, your mind wouldn't be able to comprehend it. You could not understand it. It would probably literally destroy your mind. God affirms, or God says that I rule the world by my wisdom. And then the book closes, and it says that God restores to Job double of what he lost and blesses the later part of his life more than the former. So God gets back twice, or Job gets back twice as much as what he lost. But because of our new perspective, we should not understand this to be a reward. It's not a reward. God could have done it. He could not have done it. But rather, what this is, is a gift bestowed to Job because of God's wisdom. God decided it wise to do this for Job, to bless Job in this way. Okay, so what? What does that mean for me this morning? What does that have to do with us today? What does this have to do with the grand story of our lives? And more importantly, where is God when tragedy strikes? The entire sentiment of Job, the answer that Job gives to the question, how do you live the good life, it can be summed up into one nice little phrase for us this morning. One nice little phrase. When God shows up in Job, he doesn't give an answer to why bad things happen. He doesn't give an answer to why there's suffering in the world. He doesn't solve the problem of evil. All he does is he gives an invitation, an invitation to trust his wisdom. That is the entire thrust of the book of Job. Job is given an invitation to trust God and his wisdom. When you get to the book, end of the book, God is asking Job and the reader to trust. God acknowledges Job's suffering, and he acknowledges that it's undeserved. He says that in the beginning of the book, but what he asks him to do is just to simply trust. Trust that there is a larger perspective. Trust that there is so much more going on in this world than we can understand. And also trust that that unjust action that happened, it actually makes sense in some way, but in a way that we will never be able to grasp. God doesn't solve the problem of evil. He doesn't answer that question. He just reminds us that the way he operates and the way he thinks is on an entirely different level, and that he has a plan, and he is working things out to the fulfillment of his good plan, and he just invites us to simply trust him as he does this. Sometimes, though, that's really hard, isn't it? How do I do that? It's one thing to say it, but it's another entirely different thing to walk out in trust when things seem to be falling apart around us, and God's plan has quit making sense down here. So this morning, I just want to give two simple ideas to hopefully help us walk this out. As I, as I reflected on this, this is what two things that came to my mind. The first key is humility. And this is going to be a really tough one for us. And I'm certain it will never be easy. Uh, Job goes from a position where he is demanding that God answer him. He is demanding that God owes him something. He is accusing God of wrongdoing to a posture of humility at the end of realizing that there is way more going on in the universe and it is through this posture of humility that allows Job and it allows us today to find peace Job comes to a position where he understands his place it doesn't matter to him anymore what is thrown at him it doesn't matter what life brings his way he is at peace and he is ready for it because he trusts God humility is the key and we struggle with this in the West. We have a hard time. We're drunk with freedom. We are steeped in hyper-individualism. Everything is all about me, all about what I want. C.S. Lewis wrote, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's pretty difficult to see things from someone else's point of view, especially God's, when all we do is look in a mirror. And lastly, in order to trust God, you got to trust others. There's a, a trust deficiency in our culture. Sometimes the reason we have a difficult time trusting God is because we don't trust anybody else around us. 
We don't trust anyone enough to let them in and see us in our, strugg- in our, stru- our suffering. Sorry. We struggle being vulnerable with one another. We don't want to let anyone in because we're afraid that in our weak and vulnerable state, people are just going to hurt us. Or they just won't quite understand what is going on. Just look at Job. When everything was stripped away, when everything was gone, when he, when, oh, sorry, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he is sitting in the dust and the ashes. And what does he do? He invites his friends to come and sit and join him. To join him and weep aloud and then sit in silence for seven days. Do you trust people in your life enough to let them see you at your worst? To invite them into the depths of your suffering. If you want to get to the point of being able to trust God, start by trusting your brothers and sisters in Christ. One thing we quite often forget is that when you said yes to being a part of this thing called God's family, you said yes to being each other's siblings. And the depth of that relationship is deeper than any of us can imagine. What you do for your brothers and sisters is akin to what you do for Christ. So start by trusting one another. Start by trusting God's family. So that, co- that concludes the three books of biblical wisdom literature. That's all three of them. Each one takes a different approach to living life well, and it isn't until we hold all three of these in tension that we are truly able to have a good vision for what the good life is. And the theme that runs through all three of these, the thing that runs through, that connects every single one, is fear the Lord and keep his commandments. That is the thing that comes, that comes out from every single one. Do the right thing, even though things won't always work out, and reach a place of humility before God that trusts his wisdom. Understanding that on this side of eternity, there may be things that are out of our grasp. Some things will never make sense. Just fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Now, this is all well and dandy. This is all fabulous, but it doesn't really cast for us a great vision for actually going through suffering. It doesn't really cast us a great vision for someone who's in the throes of suffering. It doesn't matter what logical or wise explanation you can give someone when they're in suffering. It doesn't really matter. When they're in the middle of it, they don't want to hear it. It doesn't help. When you're in the middle of anguish, it just won't help. And oftentimes, you just don't want to hear it. And this is a universal experience across all religions, demographics, and people. Everyone experiences this. One thing that God does give us, though, that no other group can claim is a practice. It is a long-lost practice that is meant and designed to help us navigate the pains of this life. It gives us a framework to express our experience and our suffering to God and to others. And it is distinctly Christian. There is no other group that can claim this. No other religion contains it. We catch a glimpse of it in Job's response. It is the practice of lament. And so next time, to conclude our series, we will look at lament in the Bible. And hopefully we will regain regain some much-lost wisdom from a much-lost ancient practice. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for, for your word. Think that we can come to it and get lost in it. Think of how it reminds us in different and exciting ways of who you are, Lord God. Father God, uh, my prayer this morning is that as we, as a church family, begin to trust you, to walk out and trust with you, Lord God, that we would do that from a position of humility and from a position that also lifts up others and begins to infill trust in them. Thank you for your word again, and bless us this morning. In your name, amen. So if you're able to, please stand. It's the song of the redeemed. 
rising from the African plain. It's a song of the forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers, filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful cry. It's all God's children singing glory. last words of Elihu the Buzzite just before the Lord shows up in majesty and speaks to Job. Out of the north he comes in golden splendor. God comes in awesome majesty. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Therefore people revere him for he does not have regard for does he not have regard for all the wise in his heart. Go this morning and trust in the wisdom 